Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's Couch Coding, Composer Magic. Your experts for today are Matt Cheney, co-founder here at Pantheon, and Greg Anderson, open source contributor. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the presentation in the question window. We want to answer as many of your questions during the presentation as possible, so make sure you send those in. Also, this webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to Matt and Greg. Hey, Composer people. Hello. Hopefully everyone feels the good Composer energy with uh, WordCamp Europe last year being in Vienna, home of some of the greatest composers, and DrupalCon this year being in Vienna as well. I feel we have that kind of energy to bring to today's Couch Coding. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be cook kicking off uh, with a description of the GitHub pull request workflow on Pantheon using Composer. Uh, this debuted in Baltimore. I'm sure there were some awesome composers in Baltimore as well. Oh, yes. I don't happen to know any. It's not quite as international as Vienna, but it was a great place to have a DrupalCon. And uh, in the Pantheon documentation, there's an entire guide on using the pull request workflow with GitHub, Circle CI, and Composer. And we're in the process of adding other repositories like Bitbucket and um, other testing frameworks like Jenkins and Travis. But um, for the time being, GitHub and Circle are our primary methods of managing code and running tests. And with the pull request workflow, what we're trying to set up here is a situation where if you're working on multiple features on your application, you can put each feature on a branch and then as you push new code to the branch, the Pantheon is automatically going to create a multi-dev for you to test on. And when you're done and you merge that feature branch into the main master branch, then the code that you've been developing in your multi-dev environment will end up in the dev environment and you can continue on. And, and by you to test, Greg actually means the robots to do most of your work for you to test on that feature. Oh, yes, absolutely. The, the Circle CI robots come and make sure everything's OK. But if you really, really want to uh, verify what the robot did, then there's a multi-dev. And really, it's not just the multi-dev isn't just for testing. It's for continuing development. So the old way of doing development on Pantheon involved a single large repository on Pantheon that contained all of the code that your site needed to run. Uh, but with the GitHub pull request workflow, you have two repositories, a canonical repository on GitHub that only contains your sources, the simplest set of unique code that describes your site. And then through a build step on CircleCI, we will compose the full built artifact repository, which is your Pantheon repository. And that's pushed over automatically for you. So all code gets committed on Pantheon, and only your code gets committed on GitHub. So um, I'm going to hop on over to my terminal and show you how easy it is to set up a canonical repository on Pantheon. We are going to run the command terminus build project create, and we're going to give our new project a name in this case, our name is Super Awesome Demo. Of course, that's what you call your sites. And uh, we'll just press return here. And at this point in time, the build is going to kick off, and it's just going to start building stuff for you. You can see on the first line that it says Pantheon Systems Example Drop State Composer. That is the default template project that it uses to create your project. Uh, and it's just going to go through here and install the project and set up everything that it needs for you to run. That includes creating a site on Pantheon, which is what it's doing right now, and running a build step, um, and creating a GitHub repository, and exporting your initial configuration, and uh, getting everything all set up and ready to go. So uh, this takes around seven minutes to run. Um, and a little extra time for the circle repository to kick off. 
So uh, we'll just let that. So if it takes seven minutes to run with the script, how long would this take if you had to like set up all of these things yourself? Uh, well, once I got accustomed to doing this, uh, it would take me a couple of hours to set up a, a configuration. It was like maybe four to eight hours when I was first doing trying it. to get this stuff to work. And of course, many, many hours have gone into the example repository from uh, you know many fine engineers on our ACE team that just uh, polished this uh, to get the, the workflow that you want. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that impressed me about this tool was that basically you had to give it your GitHub credentials, which you're probably having in some kind of, of secret file. Yeah, I was just going to flip back over and explain that. Awesome. But basically, give it you know give a Circle CI token, give a GitHub token, give a Pantheon token, and then it can set up. All the stuff you need on GitHub, all the stuff you need on Circle CI, and all the stuff you need on Pantheon, and you know, you just—it's like having Greg as part of your team to start up a new project. It sounds very nice. Yeah. So to avoid the tedium of having to grab your credentials during the demo, uh, and also to avoid <coughs> credential leaking in front of all of our fine fellows, um, I defined environment variables that had all of my credentials predefined, so the script just kicked off and started building things. But you can see in the documentation here, there's a screenshot of a run that was done without any credentials being predefined. And you can see that it'll step through and it'll ask you, what is your GitHub personal access token? And it gives you the URL that you should go to to generate one if you don't have it yet. Um, and then after that, it asks the same question about CircleCI, again with instructions. So you can just go over to the website, copy your access token, and paste it into the terminal. Um, and then finally, it asks you for a password to use for your Drupal site and um, what agency you'd like to associate the site with, if any. And, um, you know, as Greg's demoing off Drupal 8, which is uh, latest and greatest from the Drupal project. Uh, this tooling is also available for WordPress um, and also for Drupal uh, 7. Yeah, just oh. last week we tagged a stable build for WordPress and uh, we're hoping that today or tomorrow we might get a stable build for Drupal 7 tag. So those will be available shortly. Yeah, and I'll, I'll chat a bit later about sort of why you might want to use this approach for each, each different CMS. I think the, the, the short for answer is for Drupal 8, I think this is probably the way you should do it for almost all of your projects. Drupal 8 really requires Composer as a matter of, of its updating and, and assembly. For WordPress or Drupal 7, uh, there's the advantage to doing it, especially if you're using Composer for other things, uh, but it's not necessarily as necessary. Although, I think you'll find if you start doing projects this way and you become really successful, there's a lot of value in standardizing your approach. Because beyond just using the build tools like Greg showing, like this is the way that you can actually add a bunch of continuous integration tests to your process. And you sort of get it all for more or less free in seven minutes by running this, this script. Yeah, so let's just scroll down a little bit. I'm not going to read this entire document to you because you can go back and do it later uh, on your own. But you can see here that once the tool is done, it creates a README with a bunch of badges on it. And I'll show you those badges live in a minute when the test run finishes on my machine. Um, but then the documentation goes on and it shows you how to create a pull request. You can simply use the little pencil icon in the GitHub user interface. And in this document example, we're going into the system site YAML configuration and changing the site slogan to something else. And uh, then we commit through GitHub. And that's going to kick off another build on CircleCI, which is going to go through and take the modification you just made, build it into your Drupal site. And um, then when you go and pull up your site, you'll see that the PR that you just made with the new slogan shows up in your web browser. And not that we're recommending you edit YAML files directly, uh, but you know there's a lot of ways you can network with GitHub, and this is a good example. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, if you have not <coughs> memorized the entire contents 
of all of the YAML files of all of Drupal 8 core and all of the contrib modules that you've used, then maybe you might want to use the Drupal admin interface to configure your site. And the document goes on to show us doing that with the block interface. And uh, once we've defined a, a new block, um, you can just go over to your configuration sync and click update configuration. Uh, this is using a contrib module called config direct save. It adds an update tag here. And when you click on update configuration, instead of downloading your configuration, your exported configuration is written back to the file system where it's ready to be recommitted to your repository. And, and I think this is a really killer feature for, for you all to use for configuration management. Um, one of the downsides in some ways of the Drupal core process is that it has to sort of assume that you're running on a variety of different hosts. And so it doesn't sort of by default allow you to export your config to the file system because Drupal 8 doesn't want to be in the, in the business of writing code uh, directly to the file system. Um, because on live sites, you should not do that. One of the good things about Pantheon and, and systems that can have a sort of dev mode that is writable, but a test in a live mode that's not, is that you can have things like this where you can click one button, export your config, it shows up sort of like uh, in you know, the SFTP mode, and then you can commit it that way. And that's just a lot easier than having to download that tarball and move it around. Um, although there also is Drush and Drupal console commands as well to do the same thing if you're, if you're interested. Absolutely. We don't take anything away here. In fact, the model is that all of the pull request multi-dev sites that are created by this tool stay in SFTP mode. So you can use on-server development just as you always would. And uh, your commits on the dashboard are going to get pushed back to your canonical GitHub repository uh, minus any changes you may have made to the build files. So um, at this point, I'm going to zip back on over to my terminal because the command should be finished. And in fact, we see that it finished in six minutes and three seconds, uh, which is nice and fast. So um, now that it's done, I'm going to head back on over to my GitHub dashboard and click on repositories. And we can see that the newest repository updated just three minutes ago is the super awesome demo site. If I click on that, then I see all of the canonical sources for my site. See, if I click here on web, there's no actual site here. There's just an empty modules directory ready to receive the full contents of my site during the build step. So it's nice and tidy on GitHub. And then we've also got some badges that are put in automatically. Uh, right now it says no builds because the first Circle CI build is still running. Um, however, we can still visit the site because when we created the site the first time, it created the dev environment. And uh, we've got a link to our dashboard here on Pantheon. We've also got a link to the site itself. So if I click on the super awesome demo tab, we can see that in fact we have a Drupal 8 site Ooh. that's all ready to go. So there's the demo. Yeah. Very impressive for sure. Um, I think that, you know, sort of getting just Drupal running on the internet, of course, is not, you know, sort of all that impressive. But being able to do it in this kind of workflow, I think, very much is. And I think this is something we definitely are going to spend a lot of time in sort of questions with folks about how a lot of these kind of things work. But I think, you know, to sort of talk a bit about, you know, sort of what you ultimately see. Um, this is the sort of code base that you're working with as developments and as development agencies. And as Greg showed, like, this isn't so what you might be used to. This isn't a download of WordPress or a download of Drupal where you have a lot of familiar files. In fact, the only things that you're actually really caring about here are your composer files, your configuration, um, and your, your custom code. That any kind of like package you need, you know, a Drupal module, WordPress plugin, uh, is is not defined by like a chunk of that code that's committed. It's defined by a composer definition that says, "Give me, you know, version 8.4.0 of Drupal, or give me, you know, this version of um, a Simple Block, or something like this." 
And that those are things that by using Composer, you can sort of like update and add to those files, but that's sort of the like manifest of what you ultimately are gonna have. And then you're gonna have your configuration that's exported out via, you know, configuration management Drupal 8 or, you know, WPCFM and WordPress and use that as sort of, you know, what you use to configure the site. And then you will have any custom code you're writing. But one of the things that happens if you start using this as sort of an agency to manage your workflow is that you end up with like pull requests that actually look really, you know, clean and really specific to the actual stuff that's changed. Like, I've definitely worked on projects where I'm like reviewing someone's code and they've like updated one of the Drupal modules and maybe changed like five lines of custom code and I have to like scroll through like a huge wall of like changes that like I'm not reviewing like new updates to Drupal core as part of my pull requests. Like I'm going to have to trust in that process that the updates are good enough, you know, that my, my little quick review isn't going to, going to matter, but I do very much care about the custom stuff that's done, you know, and I do care about updates. Like I want to see a line that says Drupal core is updated in the pull request or this plugin or module is updated, but I can then spend my time and my comments focusing on the custom stuff. And, People will call it sort of a lean repo or like a tight repo or something like that. Um, but for me, it's sort of like your own repo. It's your own code. Um, and then, of course, as, as Greg was sort of demoing, what ends up happening from a sort of, you know, continuous integration perspective is as soon as you, as soon as it kicks off a build, the robots will then go and say, okay, let me look at that composer file. Let me assemble all of the different pieces that it says. Let me look at the configuration docu things and push that into the database. And then of course, let me take your custom code and push it over and it sort of will build the site each time. That's sort of what's going on, going on um, as part of this. Um, and um, sort of continuous integration is something that like I'm, most people I'm sure on this couch coding have heard of. Many of you are probably using uh, or want to use. I think, you know, for me, it's something that definitely has a lot of value if you sort of set it up and get it working regularly, but, but there's like a learning curve for it for sure. Um, part, of, part of what Greg and, and Steve and others who worked on the build tools plugin tried to do was to create an easy quick start to get going. Because one of the things I, I think that can be very frustrating is, is trying to spend days of time to like just get this thing working before you can even have some, some win with it. This, you know, in the six minutes, 39 seconds that did, you got it all set up. And then what we have right here is we have a BHAT test actually being run. We have like a, a true behavior test trying to see if the site can create, you know, page content, article content, log in and see it. And that that's the kind of thing where like once you can get that as part of your project, it's then really easy to like assign other developers tasks to like add a new test for a new thing but it's not like figure out how to integrate this like, you know, end to end, like that's just a lot and we want to try to make that easy for people. Um, and so like to me like this, the sort of the value of this is twofold. On one hand, you get that lean repository where you can have clean pull requests and you can use external systems like GitHub or Bitbucket to manage that code, which can matter for agencies that, have, that use those anyway or have projects that are, you know, are not Drupal WordPress. And then the other benefit is that you have this framework for running not only BHAT tests, but also any kind of other testing that you want. And to actually add those tests as like a meaningful part of your deployment process is simply in, in the BHAT case, you just put your feature file in the BHAT directory, or in the case of other kind of testing, you just add some lines to your circle YAML. And then you have that kind of, you have that testing that's gonna run every, every time, and you're gonna have, a, have reports back on that. Um, and you can fail the jobs if it doesn't pass and have, you know, developers go back to, to fix it. Uh, this is also from the BHAT perspective. If you haven't played around with BHAT, like of all the testing I think you can do on a, on a Drupal or WordPress site, I think BHAT's probably the most helpful because it speaks most directly to client uh, and customer sort of needs. Like each of these scenarios you see here are, that's more or less the test, you know, kind of, kind of length, you know, you've got like, given that I have some users, I should go to this page and see it. Given I log in this, I should do it. Uh, and there are some helper functions for Drupal and WordPress you can use to, as well. 
but it's the kind of thing where you can really understand like look if I'm building a blog page I should ho I should expect that like when I add a con comment it shows up at, you know the top of the list or something and that you can write a really quick test for that um, there's uh, there are tons of other testing frameworks and they all will work as well but Behat we've seen a lot of agencies find value with because of its simplicity um, and because of the fact that it uh, it sort of speaks to the value of of the features that it's doing um, and sort of models the behavior of a web user. It's not just like testing one little function in a, a big, you know, big file to see if that function does exactly what it does. It says, can I do the big picture, the big ticket kind of things on the site, the, the reasons people made the website in the first place. And if they all pass, like, you know, that's often good. <laughs> I think we've uh, pretty much covered the full extent of the demo. Um, yeah, so one of the things we think if you sort of ch to check out, um, to check out doing this, you do need to go uh, get the Terminus Build Tools plugin. That's a, it's a Terminus plugin that um, Greg, Greg uh, primarily wrote. And plugins are really cool. Well, Terminus, of course, is our command line interface for Pantheon. Uh, definitely, definitely get that and get that installed. And then plugins are ways to extend that. You basically, uh, inside of the, ter the dot terminus directory, you create a plugins directory, and you uh, you add the code for the plugin, and um, you're going to need you know a few different plugins to make all this work. But each of them just just add new commands uh, to terminus. So the command Greg ran at the beginning, the build build command that comes from the build tools, and then of course you'll need a Circle CI, a uh, Pantheon machine token, and a um, uh, and a GitHub uh, credential. Uh, to do that, and then we can sort of, you know, fire off the magic. Um, some stuff that I've sort of seen, you know, sort of talk a little more about sort of, you know, using this as an agency, I think I 100% recommend you try to do this with a, uh, you know, maybe set it up first just to kick the tires and just see. But I think, you know, where we see a lot of people really evaluate it seriously is when you're using it for a real project. So one thing that, you know, if you're looking to do for a real project, Typically, a good plan is not to try to like graph this stuff onto your existing project, but to actually use this tool to create sort of a fresh new project. You could call it, you know, you know, my project dash CI or something, and you create a new a new Drupal or WordPress version uh, of your site using that with Pantheon, and then you sort of incrementally move over the different pieces of uh, of stuff. So. You know, any code that, any, any like contrib modules or plugins you need, you use Composer to acquire them instead of, instead of actually copying them. You, of course, move over your custom code and you move over your config. And the idea is that you can also sort of learn that build tools sort of cycle by as you add custom code and contrib, you know, update Composer on your build tools repository, it'll then update your Pantheon site with all of that stuff. And so if you're sort of, once you're done, i.e. you've moved your site over, you'll have a good sense of how a lot of these sort of workflows work. Um, and that's a much better plan than trying to like take what it has and sort of muck it in with your existing site. And, and you know, and that's the beauty of Pantheon. It's really easy to create sites, move domains, switch stuff over. Um, that's something that's, that's definitely worthwhile. But doing it with a real project, I think, is helpful. And you try it, try it for a sprint and just see how people work. There's a little bit of a learning curve for sure, but the payout in the end is that you have automatic testing running on every pull request. And with a little bit of extra secret sauce, you can have those, those tests report back to Slack, uh, report to email, and get people really, really sort of up to date on what's going on. We, uh, we out, out here in, in San Francisco, we work on this, uh, uh, Drupal conference called the Bay Area Drupal Camp, which is excellent, and we're sort of building our website now, and we're using a, a process like this to do it, and it's really nice because we have a Slack channel for our website development where we talk about stuff, and you'll see, you know, some folks will be like, hey, let's change the sponsor page in this way, and then, you know, if someone is, you know, gets in there and does a pull request, they'll, you'll see in the Slack channel, they'll be like, pull request open, you know, test running, you know, test pass, you know, merged in, and that's really cool just to, like, see all that energy happening. It's also really cool to see that like that's not actually something that some developer had to like type and say I did this and it worked, you know the robot sort of just just do it all, do it all for you. So that's that's been that's been pretty validating. 
Um, so a couple other just things I can I can throw out there about this before before uh, before we do some questions. So first, like if you're looking at this and you're like, okay, I've wanted to use CI, I want to use GitHub. How um, you know should I do this and what projects would be best for it? I think like I was saying at the at sort of the onset. Uh, if you're doing a Drupal 8 project, you should absolutely try this for serious. And this is probably the way you should do it. Um, Drupal 8 requires Composer for its, its dependencies, and increasing numbers of contrib modules in Drupal are using, using Composer to bring in additional libraries beyond just what's in sort of the Drupal uh, ecosystem. Um, we are living in a PHP renaissance. There are PHP things that you need well beyond stuff that's in Drupal module repositories. And Composer is the standard across the PHP universe for bringing these kind of things together. And so any kind of project in Drupal 8 typically will have a lot of integration, will have a lot of need for that. And you want to set yourself up for success too in the future. Because you know, if you start off like this, even if you're only using five Drupal modules at start, if one of those modules in the future requires a library or if you do add something that needs Composer in the future, it's way easier to already have that in place than in try to like, you know, muck it in later. Um, and you'll also find stuff like, I was working on a project uh, the other day where I like, it was a Drupal 8 project and I just had like two Drupal 8 modules, but I found I needed some sort of like, um, like jQuery extension thing to do like some, some iframe, you know, mucking around and that was in Composer. And I was sort of like, well, I could just, I hadn't set it up yet with Composer, and I was sort of like, oh man, I could like, if I just had Composer, I could run like one command and get it, instead of like, oh, maybe I should just copy it in. But then it was like, well, that's not great, because now I own that code, and it looks like it's being updated. So I actually redid the project to use the build tools, and now I'm much happier for it. Um, but for Drupal 8 stuff, I think this is totally what you want to do. For WordPress or Drupal 7 projects, if you're like working on one of those now, the reasons to go to this kind of approach, I think, would primarily be either A, if you, have, if you are using complicated PHP libraries in those projects, like you know, plenty of WordPress sites, you use a proposer kind of, of, of includes and have a lot of dependencies, that's a great solution for that. Drupal 8 can be used to use Composer, um, and if you have a lot of those kind of dependencies, great. But I think for WordPress and Drupal 7, absent really complicated dependency needs, the, the big win there is, is the testing. It's being able to say, look, like I can have a really clean uh, kind of testing process with this. And um, you also get the benefits of having clean composer as well. And so I would think in those cases, you know, you want to make a judgment call. Like there is some time you're going to spend learning this, some time you'll spend writing the tests. Uh, but if you're like, you know, learn how to write some good tests, like it can absolutely save you, save you a lot of time, not only in development, but if you've written tests as part of your development process, and then you come back to the project six months later, two years later, um, and then have to like add new stuff, it's way easier to already have the tests sort of in place that like you know make sure stuff works when you start changing stuff two years down the road. It um, you know you don't break stuff you did before that you've now forgot about. You also, I think, um, if you sort of get into this process, another sort of tip I have for agencies with tests is. Figure out the top five tests that you really think have to happen on the site. Implement those, and then you know, sort of be disciplined. If you've got extra time, more tests can typically be good. But also, like, look at situations where if you had a problem, like you you wrote something and it broke something else, like that's a really good time as part of the fix to write the test. Uh, in fact, we've seen some agencies where, in cases where there's like regressions in the code, their workflow is first thing we do is rewrite a test. Uh, on the thing that regressed and put it on the put it in the system, and that test will fail <laughs> when we when the first time you put it in, then fix the regression, and you sort of know you fixed it when the test is now now passed, and now you know that like in the future that regression won't happen again because the te the test is uh, the test is, is is in there for you. Um, the tests do take some time to run. I think you know we we showed off the like four or what four B hat example tests that Circle uh, our project ships with. But they can take you know anywhere from 20 seconds to two three minutes depending on the complexity. A lot of the BHAT tests will like actually add content to the database and like log in and do a lot of different user paths. So it's not just like a quick like load a page, see if something's there. Like it's it's 
its behavior on the site, which is part of why it's so powerful. Um, but you know, it's the kind of thing where you also, as part of your workflow, sort of have to understand when you open a pull request, it's going to take some, it's going to take some time to actually get it to the point where someone else can review it or it can be merged in. So this isn't the kind of thing where it's like, oh, I did a pull request, now I'm done. Like, let me go push it, push it to live or whatever. You got to sort of wait and run through that. But I think that creates some good discipline for sure. You should definitely wait a little bit for pushing stuff live. And also it helps you, especially on a team where you have multiple people who are involved. Like, you know, when I finish my work, someone else, and Greg needs to review it or something. It's not like he's like right there available at that minute. So 10 minutes of time isn't a huge deal. Um, but I would say for other resources, like we definitely have done, so we've done a, a couch coatings before on, on straight up composer. So there's some resources there. We have a lot of docs that are sort of talking about this, this GitHub guide. Um, and we have a number of uh, blog posts sort of talking about automatic testing and QSNA testing. And then uh, both sort of on the WordPress TV and the DrupalCon sessions, there's a lot of really good uh, talks on automatic testing and BHAT. If you, if you just search BHAT WordPress, BHAT Drupal, you'll find some pretty good stuff. And so I think, you know, from a value standpoint, hey, let's use Composer as part of this workflow. Let's add testing as part of that workflow. And let's use that as sort of the way that we do our projects. So, you know, high level, I think this is pretty cool. I think it's awesome to see it. It's great. There's a command that you can sort of run it yourself. And with that, I sort of maybe turn it back over to so take some questions from folks on things they want to see, things they have questions about, or other commentary. All righty, guys. We're going to launch right into questions. The first one is, what is a good approach for setting up an initial composer.json that includes a theme and a list of modules? And what are some good tools to use to create the composer.json? Well, if you take a look at the document that we've been starting with here using the GitHub pull request with composer and Drupal 8, um, the very first command that you run uh, is a terminus build and create project command with your project name. And uh, there's an optional second parameter in here that lists the template site that you want to start with. So um, your template site by default is the example drop state composer file, but you could specify one for Drupal 7 or WordPress, or we've also done some experiments using the lightning distribution and the contenta distribution. Uh, but regardless of which template you use, it's going to come with a composer JSON file that has all of the basics. Now, the drop state example file does not have a theme, but if you scroll all the way down to the, near the bottom of this documentation, there's a section on how to create a custom theme. And you can see here that we've created a pull request, so we have a multi-dev to work in. And then we just use Drupal console via the terminus Drupal command to generate a new theme and there are even some really simple examples in here about how to actually set up a uh, very obvious four pixel solid red border around every th your content region just so you can see that your theme is doing something. And you know, from there you can go and add whatever other CSS you need. Another comment with themes that we didn't touch on, but this build, build tools process also allows you to add build steps for doing like SAS compilation and coffee script compilation. So if you have a theme that's like using those kind of, uh, of, of toolings, you could have a pull request where you just look at the SAS and then the compiled CSS sort of, you know, is part of that build artifact and you don't have to like see that in your repository, but it will run on your site. And that's a nice way to make it even cleaner repository. All right, moving on to the next one. Which repos absolutely need to be public for this to work? Or, since most of the builds happen on local or on circle, can repos be private? And in, for context, he's thinking custom modules, themes, profiles, etc. that need to be private repos. What about a fork of the example drops eight composer repo? Right. So um, this ties into credentials between circle CI and GitHub. So if circle CI is going to talk to a GitHub repository, it's private, it needs credentials to do that. Uh, at the moment, we are in progress on a pull request in, build, in the Build Tools plugin to enable Bitbucket-based uh, repositories 
And that pull request also supports uh, private Bitbucket repositories. This is a common uh, workflow for Pantheon agencies is uh, to have a, a Bitbucket repository that's private, tested on a local Jenkins server. Um, so we are adding the credential access in that pull request and uh, currently the pull request has a, a to-do in there to add a credential on the GitHub side uh, so that you could access a, a private repository. So um, you know, if you really need that high priority right away and you're using GitHub and um, Circle, you can always prod us with the issue in the Terminus Build Plugins uh, issue queue or, or ping us on uh, power users. Or if you're more laid back about it, uh, it'll be coming shortly. Yeah, that's sort of a related issue. If you do have like a custom module that you're, you're writing, you obviously could put it just straight in your project, uh, but you could also have that in a separate repository somewhere that you can then include that in the in the in the composer JSON file. There's a pretty easy way to say, you know, use this GitHub URL as a source, and that's something where if that can be nice for if you're having multiple sites that use the same kind of upstream modules, you can include those really easily. And if you want to add something like that in after the fact, you can always go into Circle and add the credentials you need directly, and uh, then Circle will be able to pull in your private repositories. All right, the next question came during the first 10 minutes for reference, um, and it said, what's the name of that config save module? Oh, it's called config direct save. And if you take a look at the example repository, you can see it there in the Composer JSON file. All right. Please clarify, when should Pantheon be in Git mode, and when should it be in SFTP mode? When do we need to manually switch between the two? So for the pull request workflow that's outlined in this documentation, your dev site stays in Git mode all the time, and you never use the, the dev site for anything other than merging in your branches. Uh, the tool will automatically set your multi-dev sites to SFTP mode when it creates them, and they stay in SFTP mode until they're ready to be merged back into the development branch. So you never have to switch back and forth. All right, uh, next question says, our current projects have many BHAT tests. The Drush driver used with Pantheon's test environment tends to be a little slower, not as robust as the Drupal API driver. Are these issues on the radar for Terminus Build Group or perhaps Drush Driver Group? Yes, well, the issue with the Drush Driver is not that the Drush Driver itself is slow. The problem is that when you're connecting remotely, it's using SSH. And the SSH handshake is kind of slow. And if you have a test that's doing multiple operations, like creating multiple users and logging in, then that makes a lot of SSH connections, which really piles up. So there's a, a couple of different ways this can be addressed. Uh, I did see a driver somewhere that used HTTP instead of SSH to do the connection, and I was definitely interested in looking at that to see if that could give us a performance boost. Great. You mentioned GitHub and Bitbucket, but what about GitLab with GitLab CI? Is this workflow still possible? GitLab and GitLab CI is definitely on our roadmap, but um, we haven't scheduled it yet. Uh, and I should also mention that um, the Bitbucket PR started from an outside developer, so you know you can always go in and take a look at how Bitbucket and GitHub are implemented, and if you're feeling really motivated, uh, duplicate those classes out and make a GitLab version of it. Um, it's not really too hard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it requires some knowledge of, of the specific like platforms, but a lot of what we're doing, we're sort of increasingly abstracting it, and a lot of the magic sort of exists working with, you know, the, with Pantheon, all of that stuff will be the same. It's really about how do you create a new repository on this thing? How do you detect a pull request on this thing? Um, and so we're trying to hope, you know, build a good framework for some, you know, for those sort of top three, the GitLab, the Bitbucket, and the, Git, and the GitHub, but then provide a framework for other people. If you have your own custom stuff, this approach will still work, you know, it's just a question of how of additional code you put to integrate. All right, next question is, do you commit the vendor directory in the Git repo? No, we keep the Git repo completely clean of all build results, including vendor directory. 
Well, that's on, on like the GitHub, on the side. GitHub side. On the Pantheon side, we push the whole build artifact, all the code that you need. That's right. Can you cover what it would take to use a custom upstream, like for a custom Drupal distro? Um, yeah, there's actually a couple of examples of this in the um, example drop state composer repository. If you go over to the pull requests, then uh, you can see that there's a pull request for lightning, and there's also a pull request for contenta. Um, now, the interesting thing about Drupal distributions is that the packages repository that Drupal.org provides does not support distributions at this point in time. Um, so to get around that, the people who are writing distributions that work with Composer are managing their distributions on GitHub. And uh, sometimes they add a repository section to their Composer JSON to pull that in, or sometimes they just register their distribution with Packagist and then pull it in directly. So um, you can follow the examples that are given. It's pretty much just a simple matter of taking a look at the composer version of the distribution you want to use and moving the required profiles over to your composer JSON file. Um, and it, it isn't that hard to get one up and running. You maintain your lean repo on GitHub, but on Pantheon everything is still deployed through stage and live via Git workflow where the whole code base is versioned, correct? That is correct. <laughs> Well, that was easy so for our yes. next question. Uh, where do we get the Terminus Build Tools plugin, and where do we get the list of commands needed to do this? Um, running Terminus Build project creates super awesome demo returned. There are, no uh, there are no commands defined in this build project namespace. That's right. If you've just installed Terminus, then it's not going to recognize these commands. You also need to install the Terminus Build Tools plugin. If you go to pantheon.io, Docs, Guides, GitHub pull requests, as is currently shown on the screen. There's a Before You Begin section that has links to Composer, Terminus, and three plugins, including the Terminus Build Tools plugin that you need to install. And if you just click on that link, it will bring you to the GitHub repository. And down at the bottom, there are installation instructions on how to install the Terminus Build Tools plugin. Next question is, can you please show how to upgrade a module using this workflow? Is it pull request, then one manual change in Composer to the new version and running the whole process again? Uh, yes, you can use Composer to update your modules. If you want to update just one, then Composer update Drupal will do the trick. Um, and uh, you know, from there, put that into a pull request, and it'll be automatically tested for you. Can we see circle.yaml? Sure. Oops. Yeah. And one, one comment on the sort of keeping modules up to date is that if you use a composer approach, you're sort of assuming that, you're, that composer will be the tool that you use to manage other people's code, which means any libraries, modules, plugins, and core will all be managed with Composer. If you're using Composer, you're not going to be going, you're not going to run like a Drush PM update code. You're not going to use the WordPress dashboard to update plugins. You're not going to go even use our like yellow boxes to update, update stuff on Pantheon. You're going to use Composer for everything. So all your updates are in one place to run through this process. And that's a very robust solution for sure, but that's sort of conceptually a different thing than some people have used. So I just wanted to point that out. So I've got the circle YAML on the screen right now, and I will mention that this is using Circle 1.0. Um, and if you take a look at the override and post section, you can see that the test steps or the setups for the tests are mostly just executing composer and terminus commands uh, that wrap up the steps that you need to do in order to run through the uh, test with the Terminus Builds Tools plugin. Um, on the master branch of the Terminus Build Tools plugin, we've switched over to using Circle 
which is pretty cool, faster than Circle 1 and has some nice features. Uh, if you haven't started using Circle 2 and you're feeling angsty about it, my advice is relax, go ahead and upgrade. It's pretty similar. Um, it gives you the advantage of being able to run, use your own Docker containers, but if you don't want to build one of those, uh, you, you can just install things exactly as we see here with individual commands to, to pull in additional uh, dependencies. So uh, this circle one file that you see on the screen right now is going to probably shortly be upgraded to a, a circle two, but it'll be pretty similar. Any plans to inclu include Doxel in integration? It would be awesome if you could include a Doxel stack.yaml file that matches Pantheon's server versions and configs. Sorry, what was the noun there? Oh, did I? Did I just put that one? Doxel. Doxel. Okay. You know Doxel. Um, Doxel. Yes. We uh, we don't we know we don't have any uh, plans to to include it, um, but there might be. Um, I don't actually think it'd be crazy. Um, no, we do not have any plans. <laughs> plans yeah. We may have we're, just created those plans. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. We're trying to focus focus on, on on the media. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's always possible for you to build your own uh, starting project with you know anything as long as it runs on Pantheon, you can pull it into the Composer workflow. Uh, this was in reference to a couple of steps back. Um, it's how in this workflow do I run Gulp or another tool to render SAS files to CSS? All right, so if you take a look at the uh, build steps, there is a point where it runs Composer build assets. And this is just a very simple Composer script that's in your Composer JSON file. And you can see in the default Composer JSON, if we scroll down to the script section, there's a build assets step that runs first the prepare for Pantheon step, and then it runs Composer install. So if you had additional steps like compilation of SAS, all you would have to do is add those steps to the build assets portion of your uh, Composer JSON, and those will be run at the appropriate time when Circle's building up your uh, dev site. Does the composer.json for this repo have bhat included? Yes, it does. Um, and that's something that we added, added specifically to get all the different extensions for bhat going. Um, so it sort of is a quick start to get bhat going as well. Can you please show the best way to add a new contrib module like Potato? Where's the screen? I, I guess it doesn't matter what. Oh, oh, like like path auto, yeah. yeah. Um, well, at the moment, uh, we need to start pull requests from GitHub. So if you don't have a pull request and you don't mind hand editing, uh, then we could just add in here Drupal path auto. What's our version there? Well, we, you could also do this with like Composer require, of course. Yeah, you, you could. If you already had a pull request, it, uh, then you could use terminus Composer require, um, or you know you could use Hub to create a pull request and then use terminus uh, require. What we'd like to provide is a way from the dashboard to create a pull request uh, because you know we don't you don't want to modify your dev site directly, so the first thing you need to do is, is set up a, a multi-dev site using the pull request workflow, and then you can operate on that uh, however you want. Yeah, you, I mean, you also could, if you're working locally on a certain branch, you would have a checkout of this of the GitHub right. code base. You would have done a composer install, or composer build assets on your local, and then if you wanted to add a new module, you would just type composer require you know, Drupal slash path auto. And then that would churn through and add that module to your local site. And you would commit that yeah, to a branch. To a branch, mm -hmm. along with any other code that you wanted. And as soon as you push that to your repository, then the build tools would kick off and then, you know, build path auto along with all the other stuff when it pushes it to Pantheon. 
Regarding SFTP mode, what is on-server development used for in this workflow? Um, okay, SFTP mode and on-server development are two ways to describe the same thing. So uh, you can use it for anything that you would use SFTP mode for today. The first example of that I showed during the beginning of the demo was when we used the config direct save module to write the configuration directly to the file system. Then when we went back to the dashboard, we were in on-server development mode, so we saw that there were commits ready to be uh, committed, and you can type in a commit comment there, and it goes back in the database and back in the repository. Um, at that point in time, Pantheon kicks in, and it takes the commit you just made from the dashboard, and it slices off any files that are part of the build results and takes only files that are part of the canonical repository, and it ships those back to GitHub. So you just use SFTP mode as you always would, and then Pantheon puts the right files back in your original repository. All right. How do we test different feature branches with unmerged GitHub PRs on different Pantheon multi-dev environments? Yes, that question answered itself. Uh, every time you <laughs> Two in a row. <laughs> every time you create a pull request on GitHub, Pantheon is automatically going to create a separate multi-dev environment. And so each pull request will have a different multi-dev environment, and you can just go to each multi-dev environment and uh, you know modify them as you wish. When you make changes on the multi-dev environment, it goes back to the branch on GitHub that the pull request was associated with. Yeah, and it tries to match the name of the GitHub uh, branch to the Pantheon branch. Pantheon is still limited to 11 characters for its multi-dev branch, so it doesn't always get exactly the same, but it's it's close enough for for most, most of our work. Yeah, and occasionally you might need to merge uh, merge conflicts or repair merge conflicts on the command line if you have multiple pull requests and one of them gets merged in first and, and that interferes with the other. Um, but uh, you know that GitHub now has a feature where it tells you when your branches are in conflict with the, the main line and then you can merge the main line into your branch and get that green again, and then, then you know when it's time to merge it, so it's going to go. All righty. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any additional questions or feedback, please visit our website where you'll find a Contact Us page, and we'll put you in touch with the best member of our team. And make sure you join us for our next edition of Couch Coding in August. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Compose well. <laughs>